so that's me, Scott Perry. Uh, I'm here to try to tell you the best as I can why learning doesn't stop after you graduate. There's actually a great irony in that. Uh, if you want to ask me about why, uh, you can do in the intermission. Uh, but I'll give you a brief overview of <clears throat> my career so far. Uh, because, like Owen, uh, a lot of people think that I'm younger than I am. Uh, I've been a professional magician for almost a decade. So, my work is split between a few different things. One of those things is private events. You can think of birthday parties, anniversaries, weddings, all kinds of uh, different private events that people might hold. The other one is corporate events. This one takes me a little bit further away. Uh, lots of big companies, large brands uh, hire me for their awards, for their fundraisers, for things like this. Uh, but uh, we'll come on to that one in a second. But before we talk about the next bit, uh, who here, raise your hand if you think that regardless of whether you have a job, an internship, run a business, a startup, anything like that, uh, raise your hand if you think that a professional magician can tell you something uh, and teach you something that will be relevant for you and that will help you along the course of whatever journey you're on right now. So raise your hand if you think I can do that. I can't see too much, so I'm just going to assume there's 100% of hands in the air, uh, which is obviously why you've all come tonight to see some magic. Uh, so, I've worked with, I was told that this is one of the greatest turnouts in the history of Leeds Digital Drinks, so I can only assume. Uh, I've worked with a lot of notable people as well. There you can see me entertaining Tiny Temper and Laura Mavula uh, at the Savoy in London. Um, so, a few, a few big names. Uh, you might recognize a couple more faces. This is Sol Campbell, this is a Fundraising day at Bloomberg, uh, one of the uh, main companies for Mr. Bloomberg, the, I don't think he's mayor anymore, but mayor of New York City. Uh, so he came up with Bloomberg Foundation. It's a big financial firm. Uh, Joanna Lumley, I don't know if anyone in the room is old enough to remember Abfab. And then you might recognize that guy there, uh, the Prince of Wales. Uh, and if you look really, really closely, there's that Dynarod guy next to me as well. <laughs> so this is some of my experience. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about my journey and what that may, what insight that may give you tonight, uh, does come with merit. Uh, I'm not just a 20-year-old in half a suit, uh, and it's really important that that I make that clear now because of what we're going to talk about in a moment. So, the importance of magic in the world. Uh, once again, raise your hand if you think that magic is an, is, has a high level of importance historically, in present times, and for the future. Raise your hand if you think magic has a high importance. Uh, a few hands, I, I would say maybe, from what I can see, about 15% of the room. So, I'm going to tell you a quick story about uh, a, a real event that happened. <clears throat> it's about a guy called Jean, I never say Eugene, but Jean Robert Houdin. Not to be confused with uh, Houdini. This guy is a French magician. You can read the text at the bottom. So there was a civil war on the verge of, uh, the, one of the Middle Eastern countries was on the, on the verge of uh, breaking out into a civil war. They hired the French government uh, to basically send this, this magician, this French magician, over there to fix a potential civil war with magic tricks. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it actually happened. So in the 1800s, this guy was, was flown out there or, or, or swam or, or got the boat or whatever mode of transport was available then, and he created this little box, this little wooden box with a little handle on top, and he went into the, the area <coughs> that was uh, causing all of, this, all of these problems between the people. He got all of the, the local tribes people with all of the other people who were from the town folk, he got them all together in the, center of the, in the center of the city that it was happening. He put this small box on the ground and he invited this little, little girl to walk up and lift, lift the box above her head. She managed to do so because it's just a small box. 
She returned the box to the ground, rejoined the audience, and then he invited the biggest, strongest warrior to come up and try to lift the box. Before he allowed him to touch the box, uh, Robert Houdin, he, he, what he said was he was going to take the power, all of the strength from this local warrior. And then he allowed the warrior to grab the handle of the box and lift it. He couldn't budge it. So this little box didn't move a centimeter or a millimeter. This simple magic trick that uses magnets, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> prevented a civil war. So for any of you who didn't raise your hand to the importance of magic generally in life, I can give a lot more examples to this, but this is, this is I think, quite an interesting example how a government hired a magician to create a magic trick that prevented a civil war. I, I think that that's, that's quite unique amongst a lot of industries and doesn't happen very often uh, apart from maybe in a tech industry. So that's one of the things I wanted to mention tonight, the importance of magic, which leads me on to the intermission. What kind of magician would I be if I didn't show you something? Uh, the other stand seems to be missing, so perfect. There we go. For a second, I thought I made it disappear. <laughs> Only joking, I'm not that good. So, a magic trick that is somewhat relevant. We're here to discuss the learning that happens after, or why learning doesn't stop after graduating. So it's very easy to have an idea. Uh, and much like the speakers before me, uh, it's easy to have an idea, but difficult to execute the ideas. So here's the thing. We'll treat this like origami. We fold it once, fold it twice, a third time, and here's the final one. And here's where it starts to get interesting. As that idea changes into cold, hard cash. Interesting idea. However, the really interesting thing about learning is that when you do make the money, the more difficult thing, magic never works on time, the difficult thing is keeping your hands on that money has a tendency to fade away into the ether, like so. You may applaud if you like. <laughs> it is optional. To be honest, I'm surprised that the, uh, the match that I struck didn't burn my suit. But you have to enjoy the little victories in life, right? Uh, at least we made paper into money. Magic in marketing. Uh, ma marketing, especially digital marketing, is becoming increasingly important uh, and increasingly popular. Uh, so actually, before we go on to that, uh, we'll go back to the raising hands. Raise your hand here if you think that magic, having listened uh, to me speak about the importance of magic historically, Raise your hand if you think that magic is important in marketing. Getting a few more hands as we go along here. Hopefully we can get 100% by the end. So <clears throat> it, might, uh, it might surprise you to know that almost every multi-million pound or multi-million dollar uh, brand has used magic in its branding at one point in time or another. Some of you might not recall it, or some of you might not see how it happened. So here are some examples. When the AirPod, AirPods, 
one of Apple's, after the iPhone, one of the best-selling, most profitable items in the Apple catalog. It has made them, I don't want to say billions, because I'm not sure if that's a fact. My expertise is card tricks and turning paper to money, not, not facts. But it's definitely made them tens and hundreds of millions, a product that even now, when you look on the website, it uses magical in the branding. PayPal is magic. When PayPal launched, they used this, uh, and they used it in conjunction with a campaign that used a magician. It was just his hands, but it was changing paper into money, into credit cards, things like that. Links. It is just after Christmas. You're probably wearing it tonight. Find your magic. Because what could be more important than finding your magic in a can of links? Heinz, add a little magic to that horrible dinner <laughs> after you've put on your horrible aftershave. Oh, uh, deodorant. Uh, Lush is where the magic happens. Uh, Benefit, a cosmetic brand, uh, transform magically transforming brows. Isn't that right, girls? And some men. Uh, because we live in modern times, and uh, who am I to say whether it's right or wrong to enjoy a good transformational brow? Actually, I, I get mine done in Leeds, so if you're looking for a good brow expert, hit up Boris & Co. On, on Brigitte. They're really good. I'm not joking. So you see just a few brands here. These brands are serious brands in the world of marketing. They know what they're doing. They have, mo they have millions and millions of pounds spent every year, every quarter on their marketing. So some of you in the room might be marketeers, some of you might not. But if you are going to create a startup, if you're going to sell a product, even if you're going to create an Amazon shop, or, or, or Etsy, or Shopify, or whatever platform it is that you want to create this on, you need branding, and you need marketing. They're the two main things, because everyone will tell you, everyone who's successful in business will tell you, if you have a product or a service that is horrible, if your marketing is good, people will buy it. So imagine what will happen if your product is amazing. You might become the first trillion dollar company in the world. That is a little bit on magic in marketing. So where that connects with magic, not just using the, not just using the word magic and magical, it also connects with uh, some, some kinds of um, creation. So I'm occasionally hired for companies to create digital content using dexterity, using magic tricks, using things like this to make brands more relevant. Uh, it's always important not just in marketing, not just in, in branding or, or running a startup, but in life to explore all of the niche options like this. If somebody, actually I was talking to one of the guys earlier, uh, this is the first time that I've ever been into this event space at Belgrave, and I think it's amazing. So he was saying that he was, uh, I was saying that I was thinking about buying tickets to see Akala here last year, uh, and the streets, Mike Skinner. So we said, let's, let's buy tickets. If we want to go see something, we'll buy tickets. And, and it's, it's that kind of thing where the, the, the marketing in it is so, so important. Moving on, magic in health. Lucozade, one of the biggest uh, energy drinks, or actually one of the first energy drinks. Uh, find your flow. Instead of magic, they use the word flow. Flow, uh, for any of you who don't know, flow has been coined as the term of ultimate human performance or optimum human performance, which we'll come on to in a minute. Uh, this is a workshop that I do at uh, Avenue HQ, a co-working space in Leeds. So I run these workshops once per month. The idea is to use magic to make people more productive. Uh, they go back to their desks happier, and we're going to explain a little bit more of this in a second. And then, actually, we'll explain this now and then go on to breathe. So, flow in magic. Uh, this is something that I happened to stumble upon. I, I saw a guy on a YouTube channel called The Big Think. For any of you who don't know about The Big Think, subscribe to it. It's short nuggets of information uh, that are really influential from key people around the world. Uh, professionals within their profession 
or in their area of expertise. So what happened was I tweeted about this guy called Stephen Kotler. Stephen Kotler is a world-renowned author. He works with Red Bull, uh, his organization, the Flow Genome Project, along with a couple of other guys. They are Red Bull funded. They work with some of the extreme sports athletes, the, the peak athletes in the world, the people who are jumping off of helicopters and skiing down the side of the mountain. By this point, you're probably thinking, halfway through your beer, waiting for the intermission, how does this relate to magic? I'm about to tell you. So I tweeted this, said, Stephen, what you said was really insight insightful, uh, really resonated with me. He tweeted me back saying, hey, Scott, it's funny that you say that, because when I was in university, I did magic tricks. And then we started a, a discussion. It ended up in, in lengthy, lengthy Skype sessions, he's based in the States, uh, about how to use magic and breaking down magic for the health benefits. See, magic is unique in the sense that it requires an enormous amount of focus. The, the girls before me, they, they said about your brain only has a certain amount of attention, and that's right. So your brain ultimately can only concentrate on seven to nine things at any given time. One of those things is always taken up by safety. Am I safe? Which is why when there's a loud noise or if someone was to set off uh, um, you know, one of the fun snaps in the back, everyone would look. Even though this is a really, really interesting talk, everyone would look. <laughs> because your brain is always on that, on that um, has that switch on, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I okay? Is it warm enough? Do I need to eat? Do I need to go to the toilet? Your brain is always thinking about these, these things. And then it only leaves you with three or four things that you can think about any given time, which is usually, which is usually things about, about having fun or, or plans to make or things that you're looking forward to, your holiday or, or whatever it may be that you look forward to. Going to a Hay uh, Leeds Digital Drinks night, for example. So your brain only has this certain capacity to, to remember things and function at any given time. Magic requires an enormous amount of focus in a very concise box, which is why I, I did the, the magic trick before that was, that was just here. When I was doing that magic trick, the majority of you would have been focused solely on this one foot square box. And the more you focus, the more the rest of your brain starts to shut off. So the front of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, that starts to shut down. That's your, that's your inner Woody Allen. That's the thing that might be speaking now to you saying, I need to check my phone. I need to reply to that thing. I need to get a drink. It's that, it's that voice in your head that's always there saying things to you. So when you're, when you're mid magic trick and you're excited, that starts to shut down. So it's the opposite of what people thought where if you've ever seen the movie, uh, limitless, about open, he takes the drug to open up all of his brain. It's actually the opposite. Some of your brain starts to shut down so that the rest of it can concentrate solely on a task at hand. And this is how magic comes into it. Magic brings that focus and then it rewards you in the end because the, the, the magic trick that you focused on should be good and should, in the end something surprising should happen or something interesting. And that kickstarts this process of flow and flow, if you don't know, you, you, you should, as, all, as young, uh, young adults, you should all uh, look up Stephen Kotler. That would be one of the takeaways at the end. Flow Genome Project uh, and have a look at it. Because this kind of stuff, looking into these niche things, these, these magic tricks, you know, if somebody, if somebody is having a magic show, go and see it. You might not be that into magic but it might give you that focus and it might kickstart that flow cycle because that will make you more productive for days or weeks. But it is something that can be trained, it is something that can be, can, can be controlled, and it is something that you can take advantage of by enjoying things like magic. That's the connection of magic uh, in health uh, and in flow science in general. The last thing is the Breathe uh, Magic Intensive Program. Uh, so how many of you think that magic tricks or magicians and magic in general, again, raise your hands, how many of you think magic could help uh, repair people's nervous systems with disabilities? Literally a couple of hands. Well, I can tell you that it does. This Breathe program, uh, I don't know if it's still running, but it used to run uh, every summer. They would put on a course, uh, I think it was four weeks during the summer holidays, and they would take children 
with severe, uh, severe issues with any kind of dexterity. So any kind of muscle problems, any kind of skeletal problems, they would teach these magic tricks. Uh, so they would teach these children magic tricks, and they would film them teaching them at the beginning. And they couldn't, they couldn't hold the balls, and they couldn't put the cups with them, and they couldn't handle the cards, and they were dropping everything, and they got them to repeat themselves, much like the, speak, the, 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 the talk before this, about that repetition, about that cycle. So they, they started the cycle by learning the magic trick, and then they were rewarded by it working better every time they started the cycle. And in the end, the subconscious actually taught their bodies to work better. So these children who in the beginning couldn't, couldn't move their hands hardly at all, and you can, you can look at them, I'll give you the link shortly, they couldn't, see, they couldn't look at their hands at all and they, they couldn't move them and it was very difficult to, to keep coordination. Magic tricks rewired their brain over four weeks so that they could actually, sometimes, sometimes they could use their hands like a, like a person who didn't have a disability so they would be able to use their hands completely normally. That's the difference that it can make. So to synopsize this talk, I've given you some connections of magic historically, some uses of magic in marketing, and some uses of magic in, in, in science, in health, uh, and in, in therapy, basically. Raise your hand if you have learned something from this talk. Perfect. I can't see exactly, but I'm just going to say that's 100% of hands. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Here are a few takeaways before I finish. Uh, so the first one is, is obviously my website. Uh, there's a blog on there. I write, I write various things. It's not about magic tricks as such. There are some insightful posts. For example, I wrote a blog post about the flow science and how it connects with magic a uh, little bit deeper than what I've explained tonight. The second one is the Flow Genome Project, which is Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wills Foundation. Have a look at that. It's completely separate to magic, but magic is one of the, one of the um, catalysts for getting into a flow state. He teaches you other ways as well, which you'll probably uh, enjoy more. And then the last one is the Breathe Magic Therapy Program. Uh, if you have a look at even just one of these, you're going to see that learning absolutely does not stop when you graduate. Because I guarantee you that during your, your if, you, if you went to university, which I'm guessing a lot of you may have, they will have never explained something like this in, in the educational system. And it's only once you leave the educa educational system that you start to learn things like this and you start to see the significance of alternative learning and finding things finding nuggets of information that are relevant to you and useful. With that in mind, uh, I will set you up for the intermission. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that you have learned something.